The Chasm, a massive cavern of despair, foreign troubles, and big black mud. Not men. I'm not exactly big on this place or anything, but if I had to say one thing I like about it, it's the creepy atmosphere and contrast to Liyue. See, Liyue was released on September 2020, but The Chasm released in March 2022. That's a year and a half apart, and the years themselves aren't close either. In between these is Inazuma, a whole nation, so in this video I'll be talking about the horrors of the chasm and the way it's shown how much Genshin Impact has grown. Much like my other videos of the sort, I'll be discussing these two traits through the chasm's environment, gameplay along with story and characters. I'll add an extra part like always, but there's plenty of content to be had. This is going to be fun and remember, I'm not too familiar with the place. Like, subscribe, hit the join button below, don't forget spoilers, and let's dive into this cave of content. Gotcha! Bust it! Here comes the catch. Maybe I should make better use of my time. Our bond is strong. Stand with me. Lightning purified. No, it's still alive. Why would you become like this? The chasm is unique as it's a big cave. That isn't a common thing in this game as most caves are small and most areas are on the surface. On top of this, unlike the previous expansion Dragonspine, released a year and three months prior on December 23rd, 2020, the chasm is fully split off from the main map of Tivat. Well, part of it. Even though the caves are cool, I've got to get into that later as the surface has a bunch of content too. Let's start there. There aren't exactly horrors up here, but there's a lot to talk about in relation to Liyue. A lot of the nation is primarily green and yellow grasslands with some faded areas such as the pit with those weird stone things sticking out. Probably has some more I'm missing, but anyway, the chasm subverts this as it has artificial intrusion and a bunch of paranormal mysteries which I guess can be considered a hint to the horrors. On the colour wheel, dark green is almost exactly opposite to the colour orange, which interests me as the chasm is directly next to Leisha, being an extremely swampy area with dark green grass. Putting two almost completely opposite places next to each other, I think that pushes how far gone the chasm is compared to the rest of the nation. You can best see contrast when the two extremes are placed together, this being an example of that concept. So I've clarified it has a unique colour profile. Despite this opposing nature however, the fact that the colours aren't fully opposite paired with the clear side of the area tells me something important. It's still Liyue and you can tell. The only other places with such colourful grass is the far south islands of Inazuma which in themselves are alien to their nation anyway. The chasm still has Chinese terrain with colourful thick trees of vibrancy paired with that amazing grass colour and the place is shaped like a spiral. The spiral contains a variety and high frequency of walls, much like the Qingxi region of Liyue's excess of constant mountains and obstacles, bearing another similarity. However, I'm only going on about how it's different and how it's related now. Just think about the returning part. The place has so much content for only a single region when looking at other places really subverts that. While that's true for any expansion, the amount of content is insane once we go into the underground mines. Now this shows improvement perfectly. While I personally don't care for gloomy atmospheres in an upbeat and vibrant game like Genshin, the developers cooked with what they were trying to make. I'll bring up the colour wheel again here as the first parts of the caves have a cyan hue and fog, which is the polar opposite of orange, the surface's colour. Therefore this causes a massive disconnect, making the caves honestly more horrifying as a result. And the Perilous Trail quest also achieves this but I'll talk about that later. It's overwhelming and suffocating as while the moor and the surface of it already restricted you with the surrounding walls of stone, this place is made from them. You can never catch a break from restricting terrain here and also like the surface, it's filled with wooden camps, bridges, ropes and more. It's got plenty of settlements but they're abandoned. Most things in Genshin aren't so abandoned and the only place with this type of architecture is Inazuma, which is gloomy enough. Therefore the chasm is even more so just by association. The deeper you descend, the more screwed up the place becomes. You find the nameless ruins in the stony halls which, while very into time with the story, still has a lot to do with the environment because of how content rich these areas are. I remember the chasm by these places personally. I remember going and enabling those bells because of the atmosphere. It has a lot of abyssal motifs and is quite literally related to them, and the track seething animosity having the classic against all odds motif shows this very effectively. By association once again, the abyss creates an even darker and more horrific atmosphere using that same song that plays over all the dark domains in Dane's Leaf quests. 
Purple is the opposite to green after all. That's the main colour of this area, as the deeper you go, the more that goes wrong. A lot of settlements I brought up here are also owned by the Fatui, so it seems like the Chasm loves to bring every antagonistic force together, much like, this will sound stupid, but Minecraft Dungeons. The DLC centered around the end dimension does the same thing, and a bunch of other random antagonistic forces to create a scarier environment through association, even having a variety of biomes much like the chasm. Back to Genshin though, there are pockets of beautiful nature found within the place, especially deeper in since I haven't mentioned what I find to be the scariest part of the caves. Every time you progress within this area, it's typically through one massive drop by what feels like at least 1 or 200 meters, and big drops like this, once again, aren't very common in this game. Except for Lee away, of course. The mountains, they're crazy. This is faithful to the nation, but it's scary how far down you are from any form of civilization or familiar environment by this point, and even the Fatui here are disconnected from recent occurrences within the story. Though, I'm not on that part of the video yet. Right now, I'm just telling you that it's scary, but maybe some optimistic people here will say it's familiar at least. Well, no. The Dark Mud never existed, and while I won't discuss it as a mechanic yet, its reign over the caves is honestly twisted and nobody knows how it works. So spooky. Finally, I'd like to mention that the chasm fully subverts Dragonspine. Instead of an ascending mountain, it's a descending pit. Instead of it being in sun, it's in the darkness, forgotten, and that's why it's so horrifying that it returned. Alright, I'm finished going on about the environment. This place has a tragic undertone, especially within the Abyss area, due to everyone suffering. But I don't want to keep talking about that. Let's talk gameplay. I mean, I was about to anyway. Before I go though, listen to this amazing track named Unfulfilled Aspirations. It's what I mean by tragic. Now, much like the map, the chasm is a vast improvement through sheer quantity. Little explodey ball stick things <laughs> and more cool mechanics await up in the surface as they aren't present elsewhere in Leoway. If you get bored of that, fight the countless enemies waiting up there, and while they aren't new or anything, they're sure as hell itching for a fight just as much as the next guy. There's even weird little rock pillars that utilize other weird rocks, but it doesn't seem like the chasm uses much Leoware mechanics. It's relatively independent, making it a distinct area even beyond the coloring, and you can tell they're newer mechanics. Since Inazuma, a lot of element specific mechanics have arisen, excluding elemental monuments, and you can see this due to the clear benefit of using Geo Constructs, a mechanic that is of course exclusive to Geo characters. Thankfully the Traveler can pull this off, however I'm dying to talk about the underground already. Just know that the chasm surface is noticeably modern and I'm excited for Chenyu Vale. Underground is where the good stuff happens and is why the underground part is sealed so extremely. There's things like Luminstone and Dark Mud but I'll talk about that later. For now look at the weird Geo balls and sticks again. They explode when you go near them, and while it's not anything special, they kept hitting me while I was finishing the place for this video. Environmental mechanics can be very important to an overall experience, like bouncy mushrooms in Sumeru, or in Liyue terms, those windmill mechanisms that help you fly. Yes, I had to search that up just to find the mechanic because they're forgettable. The chasm isn't. There's also spout rocks that I forgot to mention earlier on, but they appear both underground and on the surface. They're like the better version of windmill mechanisms, as when you jump, it boosts you immediately. It's very valuable for cavern exploration due to the wild terrain, especially up by the cave walls. Speaking of going up and down, don't forget the elevators. They make you feel like you're a miner too, and really adds to the settlement makeshift vibe. I honestly love going up and down elevators alongside walking on weird ropes. I keep falling off them. I'll be getting to the horrific stuff soon by the way, don't get impatient. Now what I'd love to mention is the bigger, better mechanics. Firstly, there's Luminstone. This is actually one of my favourite mechanics on paper since it fills a bunch of roles. Let me just run it through to you. It fills the role of Oculi, or Crimson Negates, being floating collectible rewards for a bigger goal. It also fills the role of simply being an all-you-can-mine, and it's a progressive mechanic used to put the chasm's other mechanics at bay, being the dark, oozing, concentrating mud found throughout. It's eerily similar to Crimson Negates and all. Anyway, you use the Luminstone adjuvement, a tool given to you early on to put these concentrations at bay, and this is what shows me both the horror and big improvement over Liyue and Dragonspine. It shares Dragonspine's quirk, but incorporates it into more parts of the expansion through a unique tool that also brings by a ton of other mechanics that serve to recharge the damn thing. <sighs> Even if you ignore this, when compared to Liyue, this mechanic is far more consistent, present, and more over the whole cave system, while Liyue and other places before Inazuma don't have this. The Luminstone Ajuvin is awesome, and that isn't it. The mud itself is incredibly scary, reminding me a lot of the withering. They use it in creative ways, linking it to the finale of the World Crest line, linking it to the Ruined Serpent, and even boost enemies native to the mud. 
It's mysterious, being pure black with a purple hue, which shares a side of the color wheel with cyan, the other main color of the chasm, and that's what links it back to the abyss for me. The mud makes sense, and it gets better when you register your environment. It's a big cave. Clearly, there's some thought behind that considering Minecraft did the same thing with the deep dark biome, which is deep as hell down in the caves, much like the chasm as an area. So cool. And I'm sorry for always mentioning Minecraft, it will stop now. I also like it for the sense of progress here, justifying a good return. Not only do we have what I'm about to mention, but the fact the mud goes away adds a sense of progress, like withering zones as I said. You're actually contributing to the world, which is a charm of Genshin that I've always loved. Don't forget that leveling up the thing with Lumen Spa also upgrades the level of the tool as well which only makes it more incorporated, connected, and helps it flow together much better. I mean, you still get rewards for collecting it regardless. It's awesome, dude, and don't forget the fact that there are sealies changed to be linked back to the power of Lumenstone and Lumenspa. They activate mechanisms related to it because, yes, it even has that going for it. And on top of that, it can recharge your rejuvenate. The chasm has such smooth gameplay, man. This is the only form of hope present within this place, as it contrasts the horror with that light blue light, it, but it's still sad as it's just the same colour as the fog, inherently still being a piece of the location that could end it all, therefore even being a little bit creepy. The chasm isn't a safe place, and that's made very clear very early on. However, I still love it. It's awesome, and it shows a great sense of maturity compared to Leoware due to these amazing flowing mechanics found throughout the caverns everywhere. I think arguably one of the creepiest parts is the life within the chasm. In the main surface part of Leoware, the stone is inanimate and lifeless, simply being a part of the world. The ores are cool, especially when they could fit a hog rider from Clash Royale inside them. But look at the chasm. There's life in the mud, the ores, the nature growing, and even the weird enemies you can encounter. However, it's not normal life. It's foreign. It's mysterious, threatening, and dangerous. That's what turns it from a paradise into a horror. A returning horror. The fact they can pull this atmosphere off says enough about how far the game has come since Leoware. By the way, it's nifty how the map discovery works, contributing to the feeling of lots of content. Dragonspine has a single statue unlocking the whole place, which also contributed as an objective that you'd actively try to ascend towards. But the chasm effectively has a bunch of mini statues worth of content if you go through the world quest directly linked to it. However, I'm still not done. Finally, I want to discuss the Abyss and the Black Serpent enemies as it contributes to both traits once again. The Abyss finally has enemies that aren't mini-bosses or stupid mages, instead being pure-blooded Kanrians and more. In fact, not all of these belong to the Abyss Order. And there are more mini-bosses that are also more consistent instead of only being found in domains within quests. This is good as it helps show how far the game once again has come. But as well as this, it's creepy as they're being tortured and lack clear free decision. I love the chasm now, not gonna lie. Overall, amazing world building both in atmosphere and in general. However, something else is integral to world building, the story and the characters. Let's focus on the story aspect first. Sit back, relax, and grab some popcorn. We're gonna learn or relearn the place's backstory. First off, it's speculated the chasm used to be an ocean, harboring many forms of aquatic life that are now fossilized, and on top of this, the geography of even when it was an ocean is completely different to the caves we have now, due to a meteorite that was supposedly sent by Celestia themselves. However, this was done during the Archon War many, many centuries ago. Due to this, after the meteor had made its impact inside the chasm, it was sent rocketing straight back where it came from, as of course the Archons are powerful. And just look at Zhongli. He's got his own little meteor, doesn't he? The results of this meteor was the absent ocean that previously existed, partially explaining the random bursts of life throughout the caves now, and the fossilization of the enemies from back then, alongside of course the alternation in geography beyond just the absence of water. The meteor left many minerals from both itself and from deep underground that weren't exposed prior, resulting in the role of a mine being placed upon it, eventually. However, during the cataclysm later on, abyssal energy started radiating from the caves, causing the Melolith and Fatui to cooperate and fight it back, evacuating the miners, it was closed down after that, and after it was reopened due to the events of Leoway's main story, the dark mud began its invasion over the caves, causing it to be shut down once again. Of course, the Abyss Order continues trying to tamper with the place, as seen in the Dainsliff quest. Am I too late? They're in agony. This is no way for them to meet their end. He also explains the chasm's odd ability to nullify the curse placed upon the Kanrians, possibly explaining why the chasm was the place the abyss invaded during the cataclysm, or it's the other way around. Regardless, that's the backstory in hopefully simple enough terms. There's also the unknown Yaksha, similar to Zhao, who assisted in the fight against the abyss, and he's supposedly dead, though the fight still continues, so maybe that Yaksha's life does as well. We may never know.
In modern times, there are three main quests I'll be talking about. The Chasm Delvers, being the world quest that initially unlocks and allows you to further explore the area. Perilous Trail, which is an extra Archon quest being the second act of the interlude chapter. And finally, a Requiem from the Echoing Depths, truly being a Requiem for Kanria, Dane's Lift, and the Chasm. Beginning with the simplest one, the Chasm Delvers is a world quest that's on par with things like Golden Slumber from the Desert Saga. It's a line of things that serves to build, explaining go on the side with the expansion's primary experience. It's simply about, for the most part, an adventurer wanting to map the whole cave. The deeper you go, the more ill she gets, but this is more tension building than anything major towards the story. This also introduces the character who allows you to upgrade your Luminstone and Juven, which is nifty. There's no other way to progress through the area, so if you enjoyed it all, it's best to get through the quest. It's pretty fun anyway. When you finish with that and you've concluded the Inazuma story, it's good to do the Requiem of Echoing Deaths quest progressing arguably the most interesting faculty of the game's story, the Abyss and Abyss Order. It shows that the chasm has a special link of sorts towards previous citizens of Kanria, as like I mentioned it weakens the curse's diverse effects. This also gives us a massive dose of lore once we learn of the Hilly Chell's origins, being victims of the curse as well. We face the order head-on as we learn that some of the artificial monsters still remember things from their human lives, and it's heartwarming to see a better look into Dane's past with characters like Halfdan. It's horrific how the Hilly Chels come here to die, being incredibly dark, but it serves as a good return as well. Unlike Dragonspine, this place has extreme relevance to the main storyline and even shares a nail like the Skyfrost nail. It's like a love letter to itself, being a vast improvement both over Leeway and Dragonspine due to its expression thematically, amount of content, and the content itself. I mean, it doesn't have sheer colds, and people don't like that. If you do, go play Valheim. However, this isn't the only Archon quest, as the Perilous Trail is also here. This quest isn't nearly as horrific and more tragic, but it justifies why it's such a good return. It gives depth to both existing and new characters, that being Yanfei and Ido, but also Kuki and Yalan. In fact, they have relations to the two old characters, serving to benefit all four of them through relation. Even Zhao appears, who is a fan favourite, and has a heartfelt moment of the end that, while I don't personally care for it, I know a lot of people do. I like the atmosphere of needing to rush to escape, similar to the Fortress of Meripede and Sub-Zero's festival arcs of the story, but I just wish I didn't need to do story quests for it. I haven't even done the quest, just watched it when I wasn't able to play the game. No judge please. I do like the look into Zhao though, and how it manages to give depth to every character. Funny dynamics and moments go on between them like Ido crashing his head into a wall, Kuki having to keep him under control, or the depth I'm going to go into now. There's a lot of time surrounding this unknown Yaksha, which is both relevant to the quest and the character of Zhao. Very cool and even relevant to the location, hence why I brought him up in the backstory segment. I will say, the mystery of the chasm literally being alive and it trying to trick them is a bit horrifying to begin with, pretty much turning all the open world creepiness into a literal variant through direct storyline. The best part is we actually see Zhongli in the end, as if he's always watching over us, reminding us players in a sweet way that this is still Liyue, helping the place not feel disconnected and really having just a better version of all the old content. It's a good return, and it's horrific as well. This scene also creates a good disassociation between the surface and underground, as unlike down there, we're safe. The chasm is horrifying, but an amazing return. I hope you learnt something watching this, or simply enjoyed it. I also hope you agree with my statement that it's a horrifying return since, I think it is if you couldn't tell. I've grown to like the place a lot more now that I've written this and I'm excited to record. Goodbye people, like, subscribe, share, turn on notifications and press the join button. I'm begging you.